Good evening and welcome to Chicago Tonight on this Labor Day. I'm Phil Ponce. Brandis Friedman and Paris Schutz have this evening off. On the show tonight, just how important is that second vaccine dose? A neat study from local researchers looks into antibody reaction in COVID vaccines. We hear from the city's newly appointed and first ever food equity policy lead about the state of food insecurity in Chicago. Those histories begin to tell a lot about where we are today. The Visitor Center at Chicago's first and only National Monument made its grand debut this weekend. Jeffrey Bear gives us a behind the scenes look. And a new one of a kind digital exhibit uses projections to bring Van Gogh's artwork to life. We give you a tour of this immersive experience. First off tonight, a new study by local scientists sheds light on the efficacy of the Pfizer and Moderna COVID vaccines, as well as the importance of receiving both doses. Northwestern researchers collected blood samples of more than two dozen vaccinated adults in the Chicago area, some of whom contracted COVID previously. They found that the antibody response of participants with previous exposure to COVID does not provide the level of immunity some people might assume, even after the first vaccine dose. Joining us to discuss the findings of his team's ongoing COVID research is the study's lead author, Northwestern University Professor Thomas McDade. He's a biological anthropologist, specializes in human population biology. And thank you so much for joining us. Uh, first of all, give us a sense of, uh, describe what the study entailed. How was it set up, for example? Yeah, well, it really builds on an existing study that we have had in motion since the beginning of the pandemic, actually in, in May uh, and June of 2020, where we recruited um, more than 10,000 people from the Chicago land area who were interested in, in a study about antibody testing. And we collected blood samples from people in their home. We sent them these cards that allowed them to collect um, um, a drop of blood from their own finger and send them back safely to us in the lab. We did a large screening of the level of exposure of people across different neighborhoods of Chicago. We've since been doing a number of studies following up on that, and the one that you mentioned in your intro takes advantage of the fact that we have a lot of background information on participants in our study. And then as they got vaccinated, we could measure their antibody response to vaccination, and we could see how that varied based on demographics or exposure histories with the virus. And one of the key findings from that study is that we could look at three groups of people uh, and look at their antibody response to that first dose of vaccine with the Pfizer or Moderna vaccine and that second dose. And then we also looked at them a couple months later to see the durability of that antibody response. And what we found is that people who had um, PCR confirmed positive cases of symptomatic COVID-19, moderate to severe infections, you know, people who were really laid up for a week or so or more, um, had a very strong response to that um, first vaccine dose, and then they had a lot of background antibodies prior to vaccination as well. But there was a large group of people who were exposed to the virus. They tested positive on our antibody test before they got vaccinated. So we knew they were exposed to SARS-CoV-2, and they had mild um, or asymptomatic cases. And in our study, that's two thirds of the people in Chicago had mild or asymptomatic cases. Those people, when they got that first dose of vaccine, they mounted an antibody response that was basically indistinguishable from people who had no prior exposure to the virus. Um, so those, for those people, they really needed to get that second shot to get to that full level of protection, even though they may think they didn't need to get vaccinated at all, or maybe needed only one shot because they assumed they had some immune protection from a prior exposure. And uh, how about, uh, what did your study suggest when it came to antibodies and COVID positive individuals that were asymptomatic versus those that suffered uh, more severe, more pronounced symptoms? Yeah, they were very different. So people who had symptomatic COVID-19 um, and were had confirmed PCR positive um, cases, they had a, a good level of background antibodies. People who had mild cases or were asymptomatic they had very low levels of antibodies. So what this suggests is that those mild or asymptomatic cases don't generate a very strong and lasting antibody response to infection. So for all intents and purposes, those people who actually are the majority of cases in the community, um, they will respond to the vaccine or have the same level of background protection as someone who was never exposed to the virus. Those mild cases don't do a very good job of priming the immune system and providing protection moving forward. Oh, uh, that's interesting because, as you know, there's uh, there's there's the thought among many folks that if one 
uh, is expo actually has COVID, overcomes it, that he or she is then immune and therefore does not need the vaccines. Uh, your thoughts on that? Yeah, well, I would have been one of those people six months ago um, who would have made that assumption, but our study was designed to test that hypothesis. And we do find that it's only those people with those more moderate to severe cases who have a good immune response and background protection moving forward. For the majority of people who have those mild or asymptomatic cases, that level of protection is just not there, and they really need both doses of the vaccine to reach a full level of protection. So are you saying, uh, just to make sure I understand, are you saying that if one has a, has a strong, uh, has a severe case of COVID and overcomes it, then he or she uh, does have some sort of immunity? There is some natural immunity following an infection for sure, but even in those cases, people need to get vaccinated for sure with one dose and probably two, but that would be a conversation between them and their, and their physician. And the reason is this, the duration of that antibody response declines over time. And that's one of the findings from our study. Over, after two months after receiving that second dose for all the people in our study, the level of protective antibodies, neutralizing antibodies, we call them, uh, declined by about 20%. And then factor in now that we were all vaccinated against a certain version of the virus and many people early in the pandemic were exposed to a certain version of the virus. That's not the same version that's in circulation today with the Delta in particular, but there are others. Those variants are a little bit different and the vaccines aren't quite as effective at generating a, a, a neutralizing antibody response. Um, they're still very effective at protecting us against severe cases of COVID because of cellular immunity, which doesn't seem to wane over time. But that antibody response does wane a bit over time. And that's that frontline defense against actual infection. So even if you had COVID-19, a full-blown case, it's going to be important to get vaccinated to protect yourself against the variants and to protect yourself self against declines in your immunity over time. Uh, which brings us to the old issue of uh, booster shots. And as you know, the FDA is scheduled to discuss the public need for booster shots on September 17th. And both Moderna and Pfizer have developed third doses of the vaccine. Uh, what's your thought on the booster shots? Well, I'm glad we have them in our back pocket. And I do think that there's a case to be made for people who are immunocompromised, um, frail and older, or have some reason to believe that they have not responded very robustly to the two dose vaccine regimen that we currently have in place. For those people, I can see a, a booster being, um, being justified. Uh, I'm not comfortable with recommending that for the general public at this point in time. I think we'll be much better off if we can get first doses in unvaccinated arms before we ask um, vaccinated people to take that third dose. And that's because that's the most effective way for all of us to have protection, to protect people who can't get vaccinated, like children and other people who can't for medical reasons. And it will just reduce the overall level of transmission in the community, which is to the good for all of us. So I think we should prioritize getting those first doses in arms um, and then see where we're at with the boosters. Uh, Professor Thomas McDade, Northwestern University, thank you so much for your insights. Very much appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Pleasure. And up next, behind the scenes at the Pullman National Monument with Jeffrey Bear, so stay with us. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. Some people walking through Chicago's Pullman neighborhood is like going back in time. Now a new visitor center in the century-old clock tower building will tell the story of the historic town. Jeffrey Vera visited Pullman ahead of its opening for a behind-the-scenes look. Does this look like part of the National Park Service? There are no mountains, canyons, or forests in Pullman on Chicago's south side, but the entire neighborhood is a national monument. And what it lacks in scenery, it more than makes up for in history. This is America's first planned industrial community. And um, so there, there's a lot to be learned here. George Pullman, the 19th century industrialist, revolutionized rail travel with his Pullman Palace car. As his business grew, he opened a factory south of Chicago, and right next door, he built a company town, which he named for himself. It was envisioned as a sort of worker's utopia. Here, you have indoor plumbing, you have trash pickup, you have everything that a community should have, but built for the worker. 
Workers and managers paid rent to Pullman for their homes in the town, which had all the amenities most working people could only dream of. Beautiful architecture, manicured landscaping and parks, a library, a church and theater, all owned and controlled by the Pullman Company. This was the epicenter of the factory and company town. It was the administration building. And on Labor Day, it'll become an epicenter of a different kind, the visitor center for Chicago's first and only national monument. Inside, you board a nearly full-sized model of a Pullman sleeper car, all aboard. This was nothing like what people had experienced in no. train travel. Prior to the Pullman luxury sleeping cars, um, travel by rail was very, very uncomfortable, very unpleasant. The car is actually a gateway to a permanent exhibit about Pullman, the man, the company, and the town, and also Pullman's important and unintended role in America's civil rights and labor movements. The economic recession occurred in 1894, and the, the orders dropped off for the car, for the Pullman cars. He reduced their hours, he reduced their wages, but he refused to reduce their rent. Some workers barely had enough to feed their families. Pullman employees walked out, and the conflict quickly escalated into a national railroad strike. President Grover Cleveland sent federal troops to break the strike, resulting in one of the most violent labor conflicts in American history. At the time, the um, railroads in the United States uh, were not trying to arbitrate or negotiate with, with employees. In the aftermath of the strike, Pullman's company was forced to sell off the town, which was later annexed to Chicago, and President Cleveland made Labor Day a national holiday. Perhaps a bit of an appeasement for, for the workers because the strike did not, did not immediately result in the kind of labor changes that, that they would, had hoped for. Black history is a big part of the Pullman story, too. The company hired former enslaved people as Pullman porters who carried passengers' luggage, served their meals, and even shined their shoes. On one end, you know, it could be looked at as a terrible job. On the other end, it could be looked at as a, a footstool for uh, self-development, you know, for, for carving out the middle class. Porters worked up to 20 hours a shift, mostly just for tips, and had to sleep on seats in the smoking car. And they faced prejudice and racism from passengers who nicknamed them after Mr. Pullman himself, harkening back to an old slavery practice. Imagine, you know, your, your name's Tom, and somebody disrespectfully calls you George. You know, I mean, you might as well just say, hey, boy, come here. But the porters could also eavesdrop on conversations of traveling businessmen. Through osmosis, they had an opportunity to take that proof of concept back to their communities and start businesses. The porters also quietly distributed black newspapers like the Chicago Defender and Pittsburgh Courier across the American South, spreading the word about opportunities in the North. They were the unofficial ushers of the, of the Great Migration. About three decades after the Pullman strike and the death of George Pullman, the Porters overcame strong company resistance to form America's first major union of black workers, the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters, led by A. Philip Randolph. Pullman closed its factory in the historic town in 1958. And like many other communities on Chicago's south and west sides, this one has faced significant disinvestment over the last several decades. Buildings from the 19th century deteriorated, and a fire devastated the administration building in 1998. But all along, neighbors and local nonprofits fought to preserve Pullman and its history. The state rebuilt the clock tower in 2005, and in 2015, neighbors scored a huge victory when President Barack Obama declared Pullman a national monument for its significance both past and present. Not a week goes by that there is not a headline where I hear a part of the story um, of today harken back to the issues of race, immigration, labor, capitalism, government regulation, gender equity. You name it, um, we're still in the middle of that story. In recent years, companies like Method, Whole Foods, and Amazon have come to the area. In just a few short years, we have accomplished a lot. And so we still have a long way to go. Some leaders say the community once thought to be a model for company towns may now be a model for revitalization, with tourists as a driving force. 
we're going to give them some place to shop. We're going to give them some place to sleep. We're going to give them some place to eat. And we're going to keep those tax dollars flowing right here in the community. Ninth Ward Alderman Anthony Beal says preservation and restoration efforts are far from over. Through the combined efforts of nonprofit community developer Chicago Neighborhood Initiatives, philanthropic organizations like the Historic Pullman Foundation, and city, state, and federal agencies. To be able to see an area uh, like this be able to rebound, be able to come back uh, through tourism, not through some kind of quick fix method, you know, but through tourism uh, and history, uh, you know, is an important thing. And I really think is a blueprint for what you can do to other areas of the South Side. For Chicago Tonight, I'm Jeffrey Baer. That new visitor center is at 111th Street and South Cottage Grove, a few blocks north of where the old visitor center used to be. Chicago has its first ever food equity policy lead. Ruby Ferguson is filling that role. Prior to this, she was with the Near North Health Service Corporation, expanding supplemental nutrition programs for women, children, and clinical dietetic and cooking programs. This new position will help address food insecurity faced across the city, which has been exacerbated by the pandemic. Joining us now is Ruby Ferguson, the city's first food equity equity policy lead. Reby Ferguson, welcome to Chicago tonight. Uh, first of all, give us a big picture. What is the current state of food insecurity in Chicago as you see it? Absolutely. I think it's important to start out by defining what is food insecurity. And so food security is the ability to have agency or choice in the food that you consume. So making sure that you have access to healthy, affordable, culturally relevant, and nourishing foods. So when we take a zoom out and we look at where food insecurity is now, at the peak of the pandemic, about 19% of Chicagoans overall were facing food insecurity, about 30% of Latinx communities and 40% of black communities were facing food insecurity. There have been improvements, which we're very excited about, and now we're at 14%, but this is still well above pre-pandemic rates. And uh, you mentioned those statistics. We, uh, we have them. Let's put them up uh, so that our audience can, uh, can review what you just said. As you mentioned, uh, in late 2020, 19% uh, of people in the Chicago metro region faced food insecurity. The Latino community saw 29% insecurity, and black communities saw 37%. Uh, why those numbers in black and brown communities, would you say? Yeah, um, I think we have to call uh, call out kind of the roots of structural racism and how that impacts disinvestment, how that impacts uh, what happens in those communities. So one of the main goals of the Food Equity Council, and you see that the key word in the council is equity, is to address those structural roots and bring stewardship or ownership back to the community. A little more on uh, what food equity looks like to you. you. You've alluded to it, but spell it out for us. Yeah, so to me, what food equity looks like is not um, us as the Food Equity Council prescribing a solution for communities, but us responding to the needs of communities and giving opportunities that are sustainable over time. So if you look in our food equity agenda, we have some very bold but important goals. Those goals look like connecting people to existing food resources like SNAP, like WIC, like food pantries. It also looks like uh, supporting BIPOC businesses. And then it also looks like investing in BIPOC businesses to then transform communities. You've, uh, you've used a couple of terms. Uh, one of them is uh, BIPOC. What is BIPOC, please? So it's black, indigenous, and people of color. I see. So these are uh, these are some pretty big priorities. That's an uh, that's a that, that's an ambitious agenda. How do you go about meeting those priorities? Absolutely. Um, so the first step that's very exciting is that the city of Chicago created this role. So I'm humbled to be a part of this work. The Food Equity Council is comprised of city departments, sister agencies and community leaders who are all going to come together on this issue and break it down piece by piece on how we can tackle these goals. So though it is a bold agenda, I think big problems require bold solutions. You are the first person to hold this position. What else do you hope to do besides, uh, uh, not that the agenda that you set forth <laughs> isn't enough, but uh, 
beyond the agenda, looking at it in you know, a big picture, what do you hope to do in this position? Yeah, uh, I think that we have an opportunity to uplift the voices and the assets that exist in these communities that we're referring to. More often than not, we hear what is not happening in communities and not all of the beautiful work that happens out of resilience. And so I wanna celebrate that hard work and, and kind of lift up those voices and create opportunities for those people to be pioneers in their space. You are actually, uh, it's kind of a hybrid position as I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, but you're, you, you have kind of a dual appointment with the city and also with the Greater Chicago Food Depository. How's that gonna work? Yeah, so I love that you brought that up because I think that speaks to the collaboration that this council is committed to. Um, so while I am both working with the Greater Chicago Food Depository and the mayor's office, my main focus is to work with the food council. That is my day-to-day -day work and, and kind of push forward this food equity agenda. So this position is really coming out of the collaboration that happened over the winter to put together this food equity agenda. And uh, now that uh, n n you know, we're still, once upon a time we thought we were emerging from the pandemic, now it, you know, the future looks, you know, question mark hanging over it. Uh, what, what do you see in terms of food equity given the ongoing uncertainty about uh, the pandemic? before the pandemic, during the pandemic, and in, in these uncertain times that are coming forward, food security is going to be very important. Food equity is very important. So I think we're all kind of waiting with bated breath to see what's gonna happen with COVID and where, where this pandemic takes us. Um, but we cannot be stalled in our tracks um, in terms of pushing forward food equity for the city of Chicago. Last question. Uh are there people still hungry right now in the city of Chicago, in the Chicago area? Absolutely. Um, hunger and food insecurity are important to distinguish because you can be full, but maybe don't have access to nourishing foods, don't have access to foods that are culturally relevant for you, um, don't have access to fresh fruits and vegetables. So I think, yes, there are people who are hungry and there are people who are having to make sacrifices and, and opting to not eat foods that will nourish their body in a way, let's say they have diabetes, but have to get something on the table. Ruby Ferguson, thank you so much for joining us and good luck with your work. Thank you. A long-awaited immersive Van Gogh exhibit has finally made its way to the United States, and Chicago is the very first stop on the tour. Arts correspondent Angel Ito gave us a tour of this one-of-a-kind digital experience a few months back, and here is another look. Inside the Germania Club building stands a new exhibit. About 40 feet high and 150 feet long. Now the immersive experience is literally a feast for the eyes, feeding your appetite with Van Gogh's greatest work. With 90 million pixels projecting onto 500,000 cubic feet throughout the gallery, artistic director Massimiliano Sicardi says the immersive experience reimagines what flashed before Van Gogh's eyes in the final moments prior to his death. With more than 400 licensed images, visitors are able to see up close and personal every detail and brushstroke that went into some of his most recognized pieces, like sunflowers and the bedroom. Now the experiential entertainment is choreographed to a soundtrack created by Luca Longobardi. It features a mix of his original compositions and works from other artists meant to enhance the emotional experience.
The new Immersive Van Gogh exhibit is open to visitors at the Germania Club building in Old Town through the end of November. And back to wrap things up right after this. Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Alexandra and John Nichols, the Jim and Kay Maybe family, the Polk Brothers Foundation, and the support of these donors. And that is our show for this Labor Day Monday. Please join Brandis Friedman and Parish Shuts tomorrow night live at 7. Now for all of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Phil Ponce. Thank you for joining us this holiday weekend. Stay healthy and safe. Good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, a Chicago personal injury and wrongful death firm that's proud to serve its community through pro bono legal services.